Hello everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to let me check my volume here as always. Welcome to Interpret and Tradition. This is going to be one of my chats, chat number 10, I believe. And I thought that I would continue with the quotes. I did a, a video uh, yesterday sharing quotes of books that I have collected over the years. Whenever I sat down to read a book, my favorite author, so whatever, whenever I came across um, uh, a passage or a sentence or a paragraph that stood out to me, that meant something to me at the time, I would write it down. And I have notebooks and notebooks of them, and I thought, why don't I share some of this with you? They are not in any particular order, they are not uh, the most uh, preferable or anything like that. It's just that I'm reading through them and just um, see if I can share a few of them with you. Uh, today I thought I would share... Um, yesterday I did Dostoevsky and then I thought perhaps um, the whole 15 minutes or 20 minutes in one author may or may, may not be the, the right way to, to go about it. So I decided to do two authors today. Uh, just a few, just a handful. Okay, one is Anthony Trollope, um, an English writer, 1815 to 1882. He is a little bit out of uh, fashion at the moment, but I consider him a great writer. He wrote about manners and... Um, uh, social customs and a lot about politics too, about the politics of his time. Um, he regretted, or well, uh, perhaps not regretted, but he actually saw how the aristocracy and the gentry was sort of uh, coming down or little by little disappearing or their uh, their uh, qualities, as it were, and the businessmen, business was coming up. They were the businessman, the man of money was becoming the new aristocrat. And he is, he lived that, and so he reflects on that quite, quite a bit. You know, he wrote, he was very disciplined. He, uh, he actually worked in the post office all his life. Uh, only at the very late, the very late years of his life, when he retired, he devoted to writing on a full-time basis. But his whole life was to write. I think it's for three or four hours in the morning before he went to work. He's actually the one who invented or produced or bought off the post boxes, the red post boxes that we use. So you used to use, perhaps. So this is a guy with a great deal of uh, uh, discipline, writing, and he wrote many, many books because of that, writing every day before going to work for three or four hours, imagine. Anyway, let me share with you some, some of the things that he says. They are not interrelated, okay? So these are novels and these are different characters speaking, so don't think that all that is read is what he believes. He's, uh, you know, there is an interaction between the characters. But anyway, let's see if we can make sense of it. One may work and not for thanks, but yet feel hurt at not receiving them. A small daily task, if it be really daily, will beat the labors of a spasmodic Hercules. It is the tortoise that always catches the hare. The hare has no chance. He loses more time in glorifying himself for a quick spurt than suffices the tortoise to make half his journey. He was the picture of a uh, he was the picture of the probable miseries of a man who begins life too high up the ladder, who succeeds succeeds in mounting before he has learned how to hold on when he's atop. For those creative originals, it, uh, it was a fate to walk over volcanoes. Of course, she shall be blown into atoms one day, but after all, that's better than being slowly boiled down into a pulp. 
mediocrity. Marriage. Uh, a man who married in youthful haste and repented daring. Uh, I'll start again. He was a man who married in youthful haste and repented during a long, increasingly penurious letter. Drunkenness. He was a little, withered, dissipated, broken down man whom gin and poverty had nearly burned to a cinder and dried to an ash. Mind, he had none left, no care for earthly things except the smallest modicum of substantial food and the largest allowance of liquid substance. The alcohol. Oh, here's one about the aristocracy and business uh, coming up, and aristocracy going down. England, a commercial country. Yes, as Venice was. She may excel other nations in commerce, but yet it is not that in which she most pride, prides herself, in which she most excels. Merchants, as such, are not the first men among us though it perhaps be open, barely open, to a merchant to become one of them. Buying and selling are good and necessary. It is very necessary, and sometimes it may even be very good, but it cannot be the noblest work of men, and let us hope that it may not be, in time, the noblest work of an Englishman. <laughs> Politics and he took his revenge by consorting more thoroughly than ever with his political adversaries. Foolishly, like a foolish moth, he flew to the brightest lights, and like the moths, of course, he burnt his wings. It is sometimes become, becoming enough for a man to rub himself in the dignified toga of silence and proclaim himself indifferent to public attacks, but it is a sort of dignity very difficult to maintain, as well might a man when stung by madness by wasps, endeavour to sit in his chair without moving a muscle, as endure with patience and without reply the courtesies of a newspaper opponent. And he betook himself to the easy glories of opposition. Every vice might be forgiven in a man, though every virtue is expected from a woman. You cannot wait for what is due to you, you must seize it. Man cannot live without a believing something indestructible within himself. Um, let me introduce, uh, I think I have a few more here, but I don't want to turn pages and pages. Um, let me introduce just a few by Balzac, the uh, French great writer. And he is from... Uh, 1799 to 1850s, 1850. He's a great writer too, I love him. Well, he says, on cities, for example, remember the time is in the first half of uh, the 19th century. On cities, the city is a valley full of genuine suffering and counterfeit joy. You must either plough through these mass of men like a cannonball or creep among them like the plague. On Paris, the city. Paris is like a forest in the new world infested with savage tribes where rapacious individuals, unchecked by religion or monarchy, thrive at the expense of the weak. Uh, let's see. 
Oh, I have here is his seventeen eighty nine to eighteen fifty, not ninety nine. Okay. Um, the Human Comedy that is his one of his major books. Um, Cash has replaced the complicated moral arithmetic of vice and virtue with the single currency of success and failure. It encourages crime and cleanses consciousness like an indulgent confessor. Like all narrow-minded people, she tended not to look beyond her own version of events or to examine root causes. One of the most unattractive habits of Lilliputian minds is to imagine that others share their pettiness. According to the logic of the empty-headed who keep nothing secret because they hold nothing sacred, those who keep themselves to themselves must have something to hide. And this space between one class and the entire capital is but a material embodiment of the distances between ways of life that are bound to keep them apart. The head has its designated place in all creations. If, by chance, a nation allows its head to fall at its feet, sooner or later it is sure to discover that it has committed suicide. As nations do not want to die, they set at once to refashion a head. If they lack the strength for this, they will perish, as did Rome, Venice, and so many others. Again, he's reacting to the French Revolution, really. In a state under whatever form of government, when the patricians fail to maintain their complete superiority, they weaken and are soon overthrown by the people. The people always want to see money, power and initiative in the leaders' hands, hearts and heads. Their province is speech, intelligence and glory. Without this triple power, all privilege collapses. Nations like women love force in those who rule them, and their love does not flourish without respect. They will not grant their obedience to someone who does not impose himself. An aristocracy falling into contempt is like a lazy king or a husband in apron strings. It is a nullity on its way to non-existence. I may agree or disagree, but he has a way with words, right? <laughs> oh, he, I have so many more by him. Anyway, uh, let me see. Um, I'll just finish with a, a few more from Trollope. On Parliament, Trollope. And then I would have you always remember the purpose for which there is a parliament elected in this happy and free country. It is not that some men may shine there, that some may acquire power, or that all may plume themselves on being the elect of the nation. It often appears to me that some members of parliament so regard their success in life as the fellows of our colleges do too often thinking that their fellowships were awarded for their comfort and not for the furtherance of any object such as education or religion. I have known gentlemen who have felt that in becoming members of parliament they have achieved an object for themselves instead of thinking that they had put themselves in the way of achieving something for others. A member of parliament should feel himself to be the servant of his country, and like every other servant, he should serve. If this be distasteful to a man, he should not go into parliament. If the harness gore him, he need not wear it. But if he takes the trappings, then he should draw the coach. Well said. Eating is an occupation from which I think a man takes the more pleasure, the less he considers it. 
a rural labourer who sits on the ditch side with his bread and cheese and one onion has more enjoyment out of it than any Lucullus. Not sure who Lucullus is, but I have to look him up. Debating. In a debate, the man of moderate parts will seem to be greater than the man of genius. But this skill of tongue, this glibness of speech, is hardly an error of intellect, an air of intellect at all. It is, as his style to the writer, not the wares which he has to take to the market, but the vehicle in which they may be carried. That's language. So it's not just language, if I have read it, understood it right, is is what you're thinking about. The language is the means by which. Uh, real anger is a passion which few men can use with judgment. About the electorate, uh, experience had taught him that the less people demanded, the more they were sat upon. Indeed, there is no such thing as a young man, for a man is not really a man till he has reached middle age. <laughs> have you read Carlyle's French Revolution? Yes, I have read that, he said. Well, wasn't it there? There was a lot of honest, there were a lot of honest men who thought they could do a great deal of good by making everybody equal. Indeed, a good very many were made equal by having their heads cut off. On canvassing at election time. Parliamentary canvassing is not a pleasant occupation. Perhaps nothing more disagreeable, more squalid, more revolting to the senses, more opposed to personal dignity can be conceived. The same words have to be re Hit it over and over again in the cottages, the hovels and the lodgings of poor men and women who only understand now that the time has come round in which they are to be flattered instead of being the flatterers. He actually ran for parliament. Um, I don't think he won. He found it very difficult. Um, we should pity him more than despise him. Whither will progress without reflection take you? It is the man who has no peace at home that declares abroad that his wife is an angel. He who lives on comfortable terms with the partner of his troubles can afford to acknowledge the ordinary rules of life. I think I leave it here. I don't know for how long I have been going on. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, thank you so much. Bye-bye.